to the very illustrative and uh, informed panel. Um, every panelist is an expert on the subject, so I might not be able to add much. I'll start with just uh, summing up some of the things that have been said by the panelists, and mainly my comments. They are not really government policy. Um, but I'll start with answering uh, first question, and then I'll address two questions that have been put uh, while I'm closing the session. Uh, Pakistan overall is an over-legislated country. Every time that any new government has come, because legislation sells politically, we go on and we legislate more, not taking stock of what has already been legislated. A lot of executive function is performed through secondary legislation, which is in forms of directives, SROs, rules, because sometimes there are legislations, but no rules have been formed, so the legislation cannot uh, take effect and be implemented. Um, and same is issue with e-tendering. Because for e-tendering, you do need, as rightly said, you don't need new legislation. You need execution of what is existing. And for execution, sometimes directives are more than enough. I'll give you an example of European Union experience. What European Union has brought in all the European countries is the EU directives. And EU directives are secondary legislation, not primary legislation, and they're directly implemented. So once Britain goes out of EU, what they will get rid of is all EU directives, which are very cumbersome, and they have to be uh, fully implemented. Just for example, access to building of disabled in UK, there is no law. It is through EU directives, which actually sets out in detail the ramp size, the width and height and everything else. So these things are to be done through the secondary legislation, and that is actually much more speedier. Because once you talk about legislation, it's a process of a year. You go to first house, the second house, opposition, uh, and that is a broader thing. But if you have a framework available, you can work with the secondary legislation. I think broadly speaking about the concept of today's discussion, uh, for, my, for my mind, we need to have uh, clarity of concept what the two things that we're talking about. One is governance. Second is accountability. First, governance in today's age is not ruling. It is service delivery. Because every, uh, I think we should put it this way. Uh, in a democratic government, if you're not delivering, you're out. Sometimes sooner in, you know, instable, unstable governments, but the, the key is service delivery, and for that, the access to information is most important. Participation of citizens is most important. Checking if citizens are satisfied or not, if the government is in right direction or not. So that link with citizen is uh, fundamental for the governance, and also for decision making as well, because today is an age of informed decision making. You cannot make informed decision without having the data, and you data, data is collected through different uh, means, and it has become easier and more transparent with use of more technology, and that is the part with governance. When we come to accountability, accountability to my, my mind has, is basically twofold. First is accountability of the decision making. So for governance, which is service delivery, whatever government does, if it is being implemented rightly or not, that is the accountability that comes through, the accountability of those actions. And the fundamental uh, tool that in modern democracy that we have is right to information. Because just think of democracy, the concept, when it started, it was, very, it was, it was supposed to be a citizen government, a city government, small number of people, direct participation. But look at the size of democracies now. Look at US, look at many European countries, other, look at India, size of it, or Pakistan, more than 200 million people. So how would government, how would that participation would come through? And I think that issue, to some extent, not fully, to some extent has been resolved 
by use of technology and that technology is the part participatory citizenship where the citizen is directly giving his feedback and in today's age of social media the feedback comes within half an hour so we don't have to wait much an executive takes a decision a legislature takes an action we get to know within half an hour if we have messed it up or we've done it right if the execution on ground is happening or not happening so the, the things have changed it has downside as well i must inform you because most of the time governments like not just pakistan i see it in india happening all the time most of the time we are fire fighting we are not really setting an agenda and saying let's go and execute this for five years and then we will be answerable for an end product it's not about end product the downside of technology is we get judged on daily basis. So that's the downside. Now, the second part of accountability, which is more of my subject, rest is just an academic exercise for me, that is the accountability of wrongdoing. Now, if in that form of or system of governance, the government officials, public officials, or anyone else who has a stake commits an act of wrongdoing, then there has to be accountability of that. And within that, the use of technology, digitization of your system, uh, and right to information is far most fundamental. There is a right to information of citizens, and there is right to information for investigators as well, because within the government departments, there are different power tussles going on, whereas, for example, if as an investigating financial investigator, I need access to your or anyone's financial data, there are laws in place that stop me getting that. So to qualify to actually get something, I have to you know, qualify on cer certain standards that I need this information because this person is required for this and that. And digitization of all that data, which is your NADRA data, which is your banking data, which is your taxation data, and other things, those, that, that is actually what is needed for that process of accountability of wrongdoing. So it's, it's an overall picture. And of course, it all has uh, some serious issues as well, as uh, we do not have, a, I would not say we do not have a law for data protection. I would say we do not have a fully uh, awareness of what, a, what data protection is. And when we, when we give our data to, uh, or we submit our data for a specific purpose, uh, is there a, s a sensibility or awareness that how that data is, can be used and where it can be used? Uh, for example, just imagine, uh, forget about the law enforcement for time being, taking pictures. It's, it's so common. And if you tell someone, I don't want the picture to be taken, it, this concert, con concept is alien. But how your picture can be used, for example, if I'm walking on a street and someone making a video, I'm sitting in a restaurant, someone making a video. Uh, as a public official, you can't say much because then this comes about, okay, you're not very transparent. But at the same time, videos gets, get made, pictures get taken, and they're used for the same sort of uh, sense of accountability but then there is no accountability of that process of accountability, which I think one of the panelists referred to. So I think one part, one job of the government or any government, not just this one, is to strike a balance because it's a protection of right of a society, a group, versus protection of individual rights as well. So there has to be that balance, and I think that would come with time and with practice and with some abuses as well, uh, as they will be highlighted. Um, I had just some very brief comments that I wrote about some of the com um, presentations of the panelist. Um, there is a lot that I think law puts in place <laughs> to say that that has to be accessible, but I, while I think... Uh, Aftab sir was talking about the uh, right information about salaries, and I was just thinking, in which country you get to know salary of a public official and perks and privileges? Because this is a question which only can be asked when you send someone a marriage proposal. 
other than that, I don't think someone gets to know anyone's salary. <laughs> and it's, there's actually a very interesting case as well. A few years ago, a right to information um, petition was filed in Lahore High Court where the Honorable Chief Justice of that time was asked to disclose his salary, perks, and privileges. And in that decision, the Chief Justice said that there is no such right to disclose this. However, I will do it voluntarily. So in a sense that, yes, he disclosed his individual perks and privileges and salaries, but he also held at the same time that as per law, there is no law that um, makes us do that. Um, one of my personal experience on right to information is I have worked on both sides. I've been in civil society, uh, worked on actually right to information, seeking information, and being in the government as well. Once, we are, once you're in this job, I would like to hide information. But once you're in my previous job or in any civil society job where you need information, this is something that I'm most worried about. So therefore, I think this side will try to do what they're trying to do, but as a citizen, you must use your right to information. And that's what brings in accountability. Um, back in the day when I was working on um, uh, uh, some war on terror related human rights practice, uh, we had a conference where an Israeli uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs official was there and he, in an informal discussion, he said to me, yes, as government, we always try to stop to give information. But what we are worried every day is that what if you are successful one day and you get that information and you make us accountable? So, so using all these tools are important for enforcement of your rights, your fundamental rights, because governments will become stronger and stronger. And how you can make them less stronger versus citizen is by having accountability. And that is not possible without information. It's the same thing. As government needs to implement something, they need to have data, they need to have information so they can make informative decisions. Similarly, if citizen wants to make governments accountable, you need to have information. And you can't make, if you file a petition in court, courts for enforcement of your fundamental rights based upon information which is not correct, you will lose. So you need to have information, and the right to information gives you access to that information. I think there was a comment made about um, the the culture of Broxy not uh, actually enforcing what is to be enforced in right to information. Yes, of course, it's a cultural it's it's a culture. It's it's the opening up is it's a process which requires education and also mentioned political will. Uh, political will for openness would also be there, always be there, because I think almost all political parties have become aware of the, the, um, the, the strength of social media and media itself. So uh, I don't think there is lack of political will in a sense that people would like to, or governments, political governments would like to hide things, uh, because it's, it, when, we, when we have to decide sitting internally if something is to be made public or not, the political side is always to make it public because it's very, uh, it's, basic, it's very basic uh, common sense. If you make something public, it's your narrative that goes in. If you are caught in the act, it's the other narrative. You, you know, whatever they are saying, it could be half true, but if you are not, very forthcoming. So therefore, this is the the concept. What comes out is first of all, you put something on your website governments, ministries, departments, you issue a press release, and that's your narrative. And then you, you know, you have set out, and unless you're not lying, that is what the truth is, because you are the authority on that particular part of information that you're rolling out. And that actually curtails any fake news that could go wrong. But if, for example, if some ministry or government is quiet on something and there is no information, no narrative, then of course there would be speculation or then fake news as well. Um, I think there was a comment about gender-based uh, divide on technology. Um, yes, I agree. It's not just on technology or digitalization. It's, 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 it's in, on all walks of life. Uh, but I think if you look at it from the other way, this also 
empower uh, women to actually be more active because it has less interaction. And by having just the use of technology, you can be more participatory. So it, it, there are two ways of looking at it. Um, but there is an overall issue of how to use this. And, uh, uh, and that is not just about this uh, segment, but it's overall issue uh, in our society as well and practice. Um, I will not uh, take too much of time. Um, thank you very much for having me here. And sorry, I wanted to ask, uh, answer two questions and make one dis uh, disclosure as access to information. I will not be able to talk to media because I have to rush to another meeting. Uh, because I saw they were actually gunning for me. Um, two questions. Citizen portal. I was going to mention, actually I was going to mention two things. Uh, citizen portal is basically what it brings for, for, for our government. Uh, it is the citizen participatory because you have access, you are actually giving feedback directly to the Prime Minister's office who is then directing or the office is then directing actually on district level as you mentioned the uh, Badin as well. Uh, and that actually puts a huge check on uh, the, the bureaucracy down under. Of course, uh, there is 18 man amendment and we do not have our government in all provinces, so that sometimes we have an issue, but we keep hammering on. And that actually, the worst thing that any civil servant is worried about is ACR. So if he's not performing and if he's not, if there are like two, three, four, five unresolved complaints about any district administrator, DPO or anyone, uh, he, he is extremely worried about that because then the officer who has to write that actually then his ACR actually reflects the same uh, issue as well. So it's, 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 it's experimental and so far our experiment actually has been quite good and we're learning from the experience as well because we actually sometimes uh, issue is fed into system as being resolved but then there is a feedback from the person as well again on the portal which actually makes us send back that and you know this back and forth really puts the process of accountability as well. There was a comment about self-reliance. I look at differently and I think Prime Minister is on record saying that we do not want um, aid, we want, we want partnership. So I think the concept is very clear with Pakistan Tariq and Saf government. But we, we cannot live in today's age in silos. All international partners are actually helping and assisting us. It's not that we are asking them for money or expertise, and it's not that they're really, really dying to help Pakistan out. It's a process. We are living in a globalized village society where you know distances do not matter. We're part of a global community. Just imagine if we were completely secluded then it means the you know people who come here and work with us will not be able to see the society and the pluses of this because then if you're a close society then every sort of thing get to be said about you as well uh, cabinet minute confidentiality it's a serious issue but unfortunately it is in law uh, that cabinet minutes are secret and the, the law Even the decisions uh, in the rules of business. So no, decision, can, can you let him decision, decisions are announced, but I would refer to you refer you to the rules of business. Please listen, listen to listen, listen to me. So far, nothing is secret because when we are sitting in cabinet, TV pe ticker chal rahe hote under kya baat ho rahi So I don't think there is any secrecy left. So conceptually, I think maybe it shouldn't be secret. But so far as the law stands, it actually clearly says the minutes and everything, the decision, whatever is announced, that is a media briefing of what cabinet has decided. And then what is public is basically what the cabinet division writes to the concerned ministry or division, what the decision is. But the cabinet papers it themselves are confidential. Now that is a problem. And I agree with you that why that is a problem. Because, for example, the law also says that the cabinet decisions, discussions cannot be brought into question in a court of law. Whereas if, for example, someone needs to see what was the logic of one decision taken,
So, for example, if the decision is not recorded properly, whereas discussion was something else, that gets recorded in cabinet meetings, that becomes a problem because then the question is, if you do not have access to that, then can that be uh, challenged in court and you can, you can reach to a conclusion if the decision was taken was a judicious decision or not. So this is something which actually we, we, we are also very concerned as a government. Uh, Prime Minister has said that we need to look into this rule that why this is confidential because anyways everything gets leaked. So this is something, yes, but it is in the law so far. So, But anyways, uh, thank you very much and uh, I think I learned a lot from today's discussion. Thank, thank you so much for